Brought to you by RunToGold.com, the premier source for monetary science applied to geopolitical, international, and economic financial news and events. Welcome back to episode 48 of the RunToGold.com podcast. Call recording on. Hello, this is Trace Mayer from RunToGold.com, and today I've got John Rubino, who's the author of uh, The Collapse of the Dollar and How to Profit from It. Uh, Welcome, John. Hey, Trace. Yeah, um, so your book was originally published back in 2004, and the the title was The Coming Collapse of the Dollar. And can you tell me a little bit about why the title was changed in 2008? Well, that was the the publisher's idea, actually. Their their sense was that uh, the the collapse of the dollar wasn't coming anymore, but it it had arrived. And... uh, so, so they changed the, they dropped the coming and, and just called the book the collapse of the dollar and uh, it, that turned out to be a, a bit premature because the dollar's holding on still but uh, uh, not grossly premature I think the uh, the amount of money that we're we're printing right now is uh, is going to cause the uh, an imminent currency crisis that uh, is going to put the dollar on on uh, the front page of a lot of newspapers we're going to see headlines that uh, that you know, include dollar and collapse in the same sentence. So uh, the, the time is coming. Yeah, it's it, a lot of people. They're they're squawking, especially the politicians and bureaucrats in Washington. They're squawking about how uh, nobody saw this coming. That we couldn't have seen this coming, and yet we've got a book here where the title of the book uh, is prescient. And then in 2008, we actually have to update it. So I'd just like to, like you to talk a little bit about the how this study of economics uh, versus the political dogma that comes out of Washington and the bureaucrats, how that actually uh, people are able to profit from it if they understand the the real laws of economics that are at work. Yeah, one one of the really strange things about big turning points in history is that the people in charge are generally clueless. At, at the turning point, and, and uh, this, this was a prime example of it. Uh, the, all the um, the basic indicators of a coming crisis were there. You know, we had a massive series of financial bubbles that were that built up to the housing bubble, which was the biggest of all, and uh, the the amount of um, paper currency that's, that was being created around the world was through the roof, and debt levels were soaring. And, and anybody who uh, was able to step back and and uh, not be involved in the day to day you know, making of money from derivatives and things like that should have been able to see that we were heading off a cliff. And yet, everybody in charge in maybe 2006, if you'd asked them, the consensus would have been that, oh, everything is fine. You know, you watch CNBC, you'd never see anything that uh, uh, that would raise an alarm or, or listen to C-SPAN. All the all the people in government were talking about how to expand spending and, and, uh, and get more tax revenues, and they weren't worried. And um, it's a very hard thing to explain because uh, to James Turk and I, when we were writing this book back in 2004, it was it was pretty obvious that that we were in deepening financial trouble and that there wasn't really a solution because we'd borrowed more than we could ever hope to pay off. So um, that turned out to be true, and it's becoming more true every day. And uh, so the, the people who are talking about, oh, a, a recovery and we're back on track and green shoots are, are, are again, missing uh, the big picture, which is that we're continuing to accumulate more and more debt at an accelerating rate, and, and we're creating the, the the conditions for an even bigger crash further down the road. Um, this, this time it will be a currency crisis probably in which the dollar tanks and interest rates spike and, and the financial sector once again collapses. But uh, all – due to basically the same process, which is excessive debt creation. Yeah, it's like they think that the cure for the hangover is more alcohol and throw in a little morphine. I mean, it's, Exactly. It's, exactly. We're, we're giving the heroin addict more heroin to, uh, to fix the withdrawal symptoms. But the, the eventual effect is that we need even more heroin down the road, and, and it'll kill the patient. <laughs> and, right. Uh, yeah, and and you know this is we're reached the point where it's it's really unavoidable now. Some kind of a crisis. We we basically um, have a choice of two horrible scenarios. One is the 1930s style uh, deflationary crash, and the other is a, a Weimar Germany style hyperinflation. And there there's really no middle road because um, we've taken on so much debt 
that we, we only have the choice of collapsing under the weight of it or inflating it away. There, there's no other solution. So uh, we have a very, very um, difficult 10 years ahead of us or an interesting 10 years, depending on your point of view. I guess depending right. on how much gold you own. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there, there will definitely be a lot of change, and with change comes the opportunity to profit from it. Uh, but one thing that I've noticed is a lot of people are scared of change. And in the dollar collapse, you mentioned something called the fear index. Uh, could you give a brief overview about what this fear index is and how it's changed from 2004 till uh, the present? Sure. Uh, the, the fear index is a, an indicator that was created by James Turk uh, 25 or so years ago now. How fitting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's, uh, yeah, and, and it, it basically measures the relationship between um, outstanding paper currency in the U.S. and, and gold reserves at, at Fort Knox. And when, um, when the amount of paper is increasing in relation to gold, uh, that's, that means that um, we're, we're basically increasingly afraid of what's going to happen in the future. And, um, the, it, it flashed a screaming buy signal earlier in this decade. Um, in, in, in other words, uh, the, the markets are becoming more and more worried about what's going to happen in the future, and uh, capital is beginning to flow into precious metals. And, and the, uh, the indicator has only gotten more positive over time as we're printing more and more um, paper dollars out there. So um, the, the buy signal... Uh, was flashing, I think it was 2000, but it might have been 2002, and it's still saying buy gold and, and short the dollar to this day, and it, it, it's even more extreme right now than it was. So um, it, it's flashed buy signals about five times in, since James Turk created it, and each time gold has, has spiked after the buy signal, and uh, this time was no exception. Gold was... was in I think the 300 range when it flashed the, the buy signal in this decade, and since then it's tripled. And but uh, the indicator is still saying buy gold because uh, because we're headed for a currency crisis. We're still debasing the dollar. So um, because it's been such a reliable indicator, it's it's one more reason to load up on precious metals and, and look for ways to avoid exposure to dollars or actively short the dollar. Yeah, and I know a lot of people think, oh, well, gold isn't money because we don't really use it anymore uh, in this day and age. Uh, but er, actually, last week, I was engaged in a transaction, uh, a six-figure transaction, where I settled it using gold money. And uh, so now in this, when we're moving into this new transitionary age, uh, what role do you see these uh, digital gold currencies playing in competition to these uh, fiat paper franchises? Yeah, well, gold has – it's been society's money of choice for maybe 3,000 years, and only in the last 30 or 40 years have we gotten away from that and gone to a completely paper money system. And that's – you know, putting the politicians in charge of money creation is, is an inherently flawed idea for a lot of obvious reasons, and we're, we're paying the price for that now. So um, when paper money fails, which it's on the verge of doing, then we're going to start looking around again for something to replace paper. And, you know, society needs something to function as money. It's a crucial tool in a modern society. And, and we're starting to look again at gold and silver, which are older forms of money which can't be created in infinite quantities by governments on a printing press. So their, their rarity and their, their, you know, slow increase in supply over time um, means that they hold their value. So we, we will come back to gold in some form and start, um, start treating it once again as money um, in, in terms of exchange as well as storage of value, which we've, we've you know, always used it for. And the, the digital gold currencies that are being created out there, especially gold money, um, might play an important role in this process because uh, if, if right now they're designed to be used for exchange. In other words, you, you set up a gold money account, you've got basically a, a checking account that's in gold rather than in dollars. So its value tends to go up over time, but you can still use it for transactions. So as holders of gold money start to uh, outperform or continue to outperform holders of cash checking accounts, um, the, the attractiveness of a, a gold money account will rise in relation to a standard checking account. More and more people are going to 
um, choose to keep their spare cash in that form instead of dollar cash. And it's possible that we just see a, a gradual migration to digital gold currencies, which turns into a deluge, um, as everybody figures out uh, that this is a better way to go. And, and the society just, uh, via the free market, switches back over to gold. You know, that, that would be a nice, peaceful way for this process to uh, uh, to progress. And a, a more disruptive way might be that we have a massive currency crisis that leads to a financial collapse. And, and, and then at that point, we have the discussion about what money is and and, uh, and, 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 and how best to structure the monetary system of the world. And, and these digital gold currencies, which have survived and prospered throughout the process, um, become the focus of the, the discussion, and we just adopt them by, by government decree. We'll see. You know, one way or another, uh, we're going to have to go back to some form of sound money, and gold is the most logical choice. Right, and now with these digital gold currencies, as you say, they can be adopted first as an, uh, as an alternative and eventually become a substitute uh, to the yeah. current monetary system. And so, so while it is serious, the problem that we've got, for those people that are prescient, they can uh, take preemptive action to order their affairs in a way that they won't have as much disruption as uh, someone else. For example, if there's a bank holiday, well, you can still exchange your value through the gold money system because uh, gold money is built from the ground up to be solid in the sense that there's no fractional reserves and it's not based on a fiat currency. Uh, um, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, that system has has been thought through, like you said, from the ground up to be the opposite of a fractional reserve currency bank. And uh, so probably um, gold money and the other um, um, electronic gold payment systems will keep operating even if there's a disruption in, in the fractional reserve banking system. So, uh, yeah, and, and if that happens, the uh, the publicity will be really favorable for digital gold because you, you'll see a lot of you know, mainstream media articles about how you know Bob Smith in Des Moines isn't having any trouble even though all the banks in his town are closed <laughs> he's still got his gold money account you know he's still be able to buy food <laughs> and, right and uh, and engage in ordinary daily transactions yeah uh, yeah but, so uh, and, and and once yeah. that happens. The, the system could just, you know, via the market, just switch over almost overnight, where everybody just flows into these currencies that, that clearly work better than the ones that the governments are running. Right, and and with the speed that it can happen, uh, people start tweeting about it, and it, it goes through Facebook, and next thing you know, it's uh, we could be seeing a, quite a quite a revolution in that sense because uh, people can fight a revolution either with the power of the purse or the power of the gun. And so uh, we're obviously, you know, I'm not too uh, favorable about trying to fight a revolution with a gun, but uh, as far as using sound money to protect against these despotic inroads by government, I see gold playing a key role in that and these digital gold currencies uh, rising to help uh, combat some of the negative economic environment that we've got uh, from this currency collapse, which is the largest in history uh, that yeah. we're seeing. So, so while while it is happening, there we do have a solution, and people can also build gold clauses into various contracts that they have. Uh, instead of like CPI adjustments for rent, they could add gold clauses uh, into their rents, for example, or into their uh, debt issuances. Uh, if they lend somebody money, they could have a gold clause in there to protect against this uh, potential currency decline. So there are lots of different alternatives that people can uh, take to protect and preserve their uh, capital and then also profit from it. What what were you also going to mention? Well, I was going to say there, there's a wild card here, though, in all this because uh, we're you know we're painting a picture of kind of a, a peaceful market-driven transition, and governments um, aren't going to like this transition because it, it threatens their control over the money supply, which is the, the main source of power that these guys have accumulated and, over the years. In and, and so all, yeah, all all kinds of crazy things. But could become possible when governments really start to panic, and they could they could make a lot of what we're talking about just illegal. You know, they could they could go after gold money, um, even though it's it's domiciled in a place that right now seems very safe. They could make the, the kinds of contracts, gold based contracts that you're talking about, illegal. They could confiscate like gold. 
which yeah, you know, right. they've done in the past. So yeah, they and they've you know they've made the gold cause contracts illegal. They've confiscated the gold, but. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, fortunately, we're currently under federal law. We can have uh, gold cost contracts and we can possess gold. So, yeah, it, it'll definitely be interesting to see what exactly the governments do because, uh, you know, their, their tendency to do the exact worst thing possible for their uh, constituents is, <laughs> seems to be unrivaled from any other enterprise on the planet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and we're just at the beginning of of, uh, of one of the all-time great government panics when they find out that uh, their system, their monetary system doesn't work anymore. <laughs> um, we're we're going to see some uh, some stuff that um, will, will shock even you and I who are looking for this kind of stuff. I think. And right. Uh, like, it, I mean, if we think they're a rogue elephant on the world stage now, just wait till they're truly panicked. <laughs> oh yeah, and and so the, the solution becomes. Diversification, because there's no one um, way of, of attempting to get your money away from the government is is 100% safe. So you want to try three or four, like like we were talking about before the, the this call started. Um, foreign real estate, you know, you buy some property offshore, and that that's one thing you can do that that potentially puts some of your capital beyond the reach of your your home government, and and store bullion in a, a bank in another country, and and a digital gold account. And, and foreign stock stock brokerage account. You know there are lots of things you can do, and it, it's a good idea to the extent that you have the capital to do it, it to, to do a lot of them because that that guarantees or at least increases the odds that some of your capital survives whatever it is the government tries to pull later. Yeah, I remember last time I was up at the Cambridge House conference uh, in Vancouver, we had a little kind of special get together with about fifty of us. And the main topic for the 45 of the 50 minutes was political risk. And so minimizing that political risk is, uh, I agree, it's extremely important, especially in uh, this day and age. Well, I know that you've got to run to uh, do a House Street interview, so I'd just like to thank you for uh, coming on uh, today and, and sharing some of your expertise with the listeners here. Well, thanks a lot, Trace. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to the 48th episode of the RunToGold.com podcast, where we had John Rubino discuss the coming collapse of the dollar. You've been listening to the RunToGold.com podcast, the premier source for applied monetary science on the web.